Hey everyone, it's Kenji. Um, today we are making some miso glazed salmon. Uh, this is like a five minute recipe. Well, it takes about five minutes of cooking. Um, you can do it in the broiler oven. I'm gonna do it in the um, the rock box out here. Um, or maybe the uni, I don't know. We'll do it in one of the other of the pizza ovens. Um, so, starting with some salmon. Um, first you wanna just get rid of any of the bones. You don't have to do this. Um, this is a salmon filet, by the way. Um, wild Atlantic, you don't have to get rid of the bones, but you know, it's a little bit nicer if you do. Um, so this recipe, it works really well with salmon. It works well with um, black cod. It works well with sable fish. Ah, those are the same fish. It works well, that well with uh, escalar or um, Chilean sea bass. Um, I prefer the salmon just because it's inexpensive and widely available. Um, so when you're getting rid of the bones, what you want to do is you take the fillet, and this is the belly side, this is the top side. They're, these are the bones, the pin bones that run along the top side. And if you kind of run your finger along here, you'll feel them and they'll all poke up. And then you want to pull with a pair of tweezers, you want to pull with the direction of the bone. So you don't want to, the idea is that you want to sort of damage the skin as little as possible. So you want to pull directly in the same direction that the bones are facing. And they should pop right out. You can use a pair of needle nose pliers for this if you want. I mean, you also want to make sure you get all the ones that are cut where the fillet was cut so they can continue down this way. They get shorter and shorter, obviously, because they were cut. And more on this side, nope. And then sometimes there's a couple on the belly side, like these guys here. Um, and again, you don't have to take those out. You know, if you don't take them out now, it just means people are gonna have to pick bones out of their salmon later on, but you know, not the end of the world. All right, so for our marinade, we're gonna take some white miso, this is Saikyo miso. You can also use plain old, um, you know, plain old yellow miso, red miso, any kind of miso, honestly, is fine. But this um, Saikyo white miso, sweet miso, tends to work really well with these flavors. Um, so about, let's say about a quarter cup or so, something like that. And we're gonna add about a third of a cup of sake. A little bit more sake. Um, if you don't want to do sake, you can skip it. You can use broth. Um, you can, you know, broth a da small, small dash of vinegar with some broth or water with a dash of vinegar just for a little bit of acidity. Um, a couple of tablespoons of soy sauce, not too much soy sauce. And then about a quarter of a cup or so brown sugar. You can use regular sugar, you can use honey. Anything kind of sweet will work. Um, and then some oil, a couple tablespoons of oil. I'm just using olive oil because I have it here. You could use, there's no real reason to use expensive olive oil. Um, honestly, I don't know why I use that oil right now. Whisk it all together with the tiny whisk that I know you all have. Some people mentioned that um, Andrew Ray from Binging with Babish has a, a thing for for tiny whisks. I, I was not aware of that, but um, I like him. He's a good guy. And if he likes tiny whisks, then uh, all the better. All right, we're gonna give this a little taste. Good, yeah, you want there to be like a nice balance of salty and sweet. Then we're gonna just take our salmon. Plop it right in there. And get kind of every side coated. And that's it. You can take your salmon and leave it like on a tray with this marinade. Um, and leave it marinating for, you know, a couple days if you want. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really penetrate too far. What it does is it's because it's kind of salty, it kind of acts, it's going to act kind of like a brine, um, which means that it's going to break down some of the muscle structure in there and, um, and make it so that it retains a little bit extra moisture as it cooks. Um, which is how, how brines work. Um, so the longer you let it go in here, the sort of moister it's going to become, and also the sort of more firm the flesh is going to become. Um, so I would do it up to a couple days, but honestly you can leave it, you can cook it immediately. Um, I have the oven preheating, so it's going to take probably about half an hour to preheat. And so we will be back after I wash my hands in 45 minutes. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the salmon. So I've got this foil here. Um, and so, by the way, like I mentioned, you can do this in the broiler at home. It takes, you know, it's like it cooks in about, well, this is a pretty thick piece, so it might take about 10 minutes, but um, the average size piece of salmon that you get at the supermarket would cook in about five minutes or so. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pick the salmon up. 
Put it straight into a tray with foil. Now the point of the foil, there's a couple reasons why you have this foil um, and we'll, well, you'll see why. So I've had that oven now preheating for about 45 minutes. Um, on, uh, I had it preheating on high and now I'm gonna put the salmon in there and we'll um, lower the heat down a little bit when we do, because just because this is such a thick piece of salmon, it's, um, it's gonna cook way too, it's gonna brown way too fast if we keep it on high. So in there, I'll lower the heat down to relatively moderate heat. All right, in the meantime, I'm gonna take these vegetables, set this aside. I'm also gonna cook these vegetables, uh, this little broccolini and some uh, maitake mushrooms. Um, I'm gonna cook them in that oven as well. So, extra virgin olive oil, salt, and pepper. Also got this salad, I'm gonna do some little salt pepper in there. Uh, that's just uh, baby arugula, um, cherry tomatoes, red onions, uh, cucumber. I'm gonna use this, my favorite bottle dressing. It's a sesame, bit, sesame based dressing, really good. So um, this miso, you know, miso marinade, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly when it started. In fact, I'm not even positive whether it's a, uh, you know, a very traditional Japanese thing or uh, it's a more modern thing. I know for a fact that, you know, Nobu, um, Nobu Matsuhira from you know, his restaurant, Nobu, he's responsible for sort of popularizing it um, in the, I'd say in the 90s. Miso marinated uh, black cod became like a thing and now every restaurant serves it. But um, I'm pretty sure it's actually a traditional Japanese preparation. I might be totally wrong, someone can correct me on that. Um, we used to do miso black cod at um, a restaurant I worked at, um, Cleo in Boston. Um, the chef there is Ken Oranger. Um, he was super into Japanese techniques and ingredients. Um, and so we did a miso marinated black cod there. Um, we would serve it with a um, eggplant braised with um, oyster sauce and pork uh, and XO sauce. Um, and then some uh, braised green, uh, it's not, sorry, stir fried greens. Um, and some, um, oh shoot, I don't remember. We called it funny rice. It was, uh, it was this kind of, this is the special type of like kind of yellowish rice. I don't think, I don't know if it was even rice or if it was some other kind of grain that we would get. Um, ooh, look at that. It's looking gorgeous, huh? You see the color on that? Um, and we would cook it in dashi. So rice cooked in dashi. Or some kind of grain cooked in dashi. Goes really well with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to... So the reason I put that foil is that once it starts to... If it starts to like threaten to burn a little bit on the side, you can kind of take the foil up like that and shield it. So that way it stops just that part of the, uh, it stops that part of the fish from overcooking. Um, at the restaurant we would do this in a salamander, you know, like a, a very, a high heat um, infrared, um, you know, all infrared heat as opposed to, um, you know, conductive or convection heat. Uh, basically like a high end broiler, that's what you would do in a restaurant. Um, and it was a great, it was one of my favorite dishes there. Um, you know, favorite dishes to cook because it picked up really easily, picked up in, you know, it was a five minute pickup and you throw it in the broiler and then, um, with black cod, the way it works is that when it's done, you can tell that it's done, um, because by the time it's done, the bones pull out very, very easily. Um, with salmon, by the time the bones pull out easily, I think it's overdone because with salmon, I prefer a much, you know, very, very rare center. Um, you know, of course, if you like your meat more, if you like your salmon more well done, you would um, cook it longer. Um, an interesting thing about, you know, the doneness of meats versus um, cooking temperature uh, is that, ironically, you know, the, the, the more well done you like your meat, um, that is the more cooked you want it at the center, uh, the lower the temperature you should be cooking at. Because um, what you want to do is you want to match the timing so that the center of the meat uh, come, becomes done as the um, outside of the meat browns to the level that you want it. Oop, we're gonna take a little break because my daughter's here. 
So I was talking about doneness of meat. So what you want to do is you want to match the doneness of the um, the very center of the meat with the browning on the outside. So if you want the inside done more, um, you know, if you t cook it at too high a temperature, what happens is the outside of it ends up browning too much, maybe burning before the inside is completely done. Um, whereas conversely, if you if you want like something rare or medium rare inside, um, if you cook it at too low a temperature, the outside will not have browned enough by the time the inside is already cooked through. Um, so generally, if you want something, if you want to serve something medium rare or to rare, you cook it at very high heat. Um, whereas if you want to serve something uh, more on the well done, medium to well done side, um, you would cook it over lower heat. The same thing is true for a larger cut of meat. Um, you know, the larger the cut of meat, the lower the, the, lower the temperature of the, um, the cooking method you want to use. So whether that's in the oven or on the grill or whatever, the lower, the larger the cut of meat, the lower the heat you want to use. The larger the meat, the lower the heat. Right, let's see how that salmon is doing. Ooh, looking very nice. Feeling still a little bit mm, tasty. Feeling a little bit rare, a little bit too rare, I think. So we're gonna let this. Um, I'm gonna shield it a little bit more. Pop it back in there. Um, I think you know it's it's almost at the color level that I want. So uh, it'll just take another moment or two. I don't know if I have any more interesting stories to tell you while that while that fish cooks. Um, oh, I can tell you about my table. Um, people have commented on this table. This table is a solid slab of redwood. Um, I built it myself. So what what that means is I basically took I got a big slab of wood. Um, so these benches on both sides of the table all used to be one long slab that I got cut, um, split the benches down the middle, and then made them into benches, and then, you know, 99% of woodworking is in the finishing, so it's a lot and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of sanding, um, and then this has a dozen coats of uh, marine varnish, water locks marine varnish on it, um, so it's pretty rust hardy on the outside, um, finished it with um, um, steel wool. The reason there's two benches on this side, and there's only one bench on this side, is because I originally intended it to be two big benches, but this one, while I was constructing it, I stupidly, um, so they're reinforced on the bottom with this, uh, oh, well these ones are, the, the longer one is reinforced on the bottom with this angle bar, steel angle bar, um, and that's what gives it strength. Um, this one, I accidentally, while I was constructing it, um, I was reaching across to do something and I put my knee on it um, before I had reinforced it, and so it cracked in half. Um, and that's why there are two benches on that side. Although now that it's happened, I actually kind of like the, I like the versatility of having two on that side. Um, all right, so this salmon I think is done, ready to serve. Um, we'll let it rest a little bit while the vegetables cook. Do this at high heat. <clears throat> let it rest by. Just tent it very gently with foil. Just retain a little bit more heat. Um, so those vegetables are gonna cook. Um, and so the salmon, uh, what I'm gonna finish it with is some of this. Um, so this is a essentially a, like a teriyaki glaze. So it's equal parts um, sugar by volume, equal parts by volume. I take sugar, soy sauce, sake, uh, and mirin. And if mirin is like a sweet Japanese rice wine, if you can't find mirin, what you can do is you can take um, two parts sugar, two parts uh, two parts sugar, two parts sake, and one part soy sauce, um, and cook those all down together in a pan. Reduce, reduce, reduce until it becomes nice and syrupy like this. Um, and then what I do is like if I have ginger scraps or sometimes garlic scraps, I just throw them into the container, um, and they'll add the fla add their flavor. So this used to, you know I I make it like maybe um, a pint at a time. And um, uh, and to make like one pint of this stuff, you would probably start with like, mm, you'll probably start with um, three quarters of a, uh, sorry, you would start with um, one and a half cups of, uh, one and a half cups of soy sauce, one and a half cups of sake, one and a half cups of sugar, and one and a half cups of mirin. And you reduce that all down to a pint and it becomes this kind of thick, sticky stuff. Um, so I start with a pint at a time. I add my ginger scraps and garlic scraps to it as I go along. If it gets too full, I take some of them out and toss them. Um, but as it goes on, it gets more and more gingery and garlicky flavored. Um, and you use this glaze, um, so it's basically like a teriyaki glaze, so you can use it on 
you know, chicken, you can use it on fish, you can drizzle over vegetables. Um, we use it on, uh, we buy, you know, frozen unagi, frozen eel, uh, freshwater eel, which is sort of the, one of the more traditional ways to use it. Um, in Japan, by the way, you know, teriyaki, I think in the, in the U.S., you get these kind of big chunks of meat um, or seared chicken or whatever. It's usually like beef and chicken that you get with teriyaki sauce. Um, in Japan, it's much more common to have it with things like fish, um, you know, fish and eel, and, uh, and sometimes chicken, like at yakitori places, you would have teriyaki. Um, teriyaki means uh, shiny roasted. I think, that, I think that's the sort of... That's basically the translation. It, it refers to the fact that you do it for grilled and roasted meats, um, and uh, and it gives it a shiny color. I love maitake mushrooms that are just grilled eggs. Oh god, they smell so good. All right, um, I pumped this back up to high heat, by the way, and we are almost ready to eat, huh? I'm gonna garnish this all with a little black sesame. We'll do another quick jump cut because um, this is a boring video to watch. You know, I still haven't decided whether I'm going to make the rock box or the uni my uh, sort of main oven. Um, they're both fantastic. You know, the uni, the size is nice. Um, although I hear rock box is going to be coming out with larger models soon. Um, so um, the size of the uni is nice, um, but I do like the du dual fuel aspect of the rock box. It also preheats a little bit faster. Um, and actually tends to retain its heat a little bit longer, a little bit better than the uni does because it's just sort of, for its mass, it's, it, um, for its size, it, it's more massive, it's a lot heavier. Um, originally, at some point, I was thinking I would cut um, a hole into the top of this table, which I, um, I originally built just for the Weber and to have space um, to cook on, but then I got these pizza ovens and they kind of fit nicely on theirs. Oops, my daughter. All right, she's fine. Um, I built a this table for the um, the Weber kettle over here and cut this hole into it. Um, but I th what I'm thinking I'm doing of doing so the rock box that has this fuel can at the back. Um, you can see it in the back there, that little cylindrical thing. Um, what I was thinking of doing was cutting a hole in the table, um, taking the legs off the rock box, um, cutting a hole in the table uh, so that that cylindrical part can just rest underneath. Um, and then the rock box can basically just sit with no clearance underneath it um, and it would sit flat on the barbecue table um, Which might be useful either that or I might build a side rack where it sits um, So that's the reason why I might keep the rock box, um, but I might do the same with the uni. I don't know We'll we'll see maybe I'll just I'll probably I'll just keep both of them because they're both they're both nice um, Okay Broccolini Delicious, delicious maitake mushrooms. Shut off the grill. Okay, now we're gonna take our salmon. Look at that, gorgeous. Oops, I can hear it now, what people are gonna do on, comment on this video is me using a spatula I used to pick up the raw fish. Um, this fish is good, I would eat it, I would eat it raw, so I, don't, I really don't care that I'm recycling the, uh, the spatula for it. So you see, I don't know if you noticed that, so the way I, pick it up I kind of wedge the tip of the um, tip of the spatula between the skin and the meat that way when you pick it up whoop, if you don't drop it like me the skin comes off and you get just the meat Gee, that's gonna be my treat there mmm You know, me. And if you ever uh, cut up, break off the end of your salmon like that, all you do is shift your vegetables around so that it covers up. There you go. Beautiful, right? Oh, yeah, Shabby, you want a treat? Here you go. Sit. Good girl.
<laughs> cool. I'm drizzle this with our teriyaki glaze. Get some on the mushrooms too. And on the broccolini. Mmm, nice and gingery that one. Because we're getting down to the, the end of the line. Alright, and last thing. Last thing we do. Just a little bit of this. Black sesame seed. You can use regular sesame seed. You can use nothing at all if you don't if you don't want to. It doesn't really matter. You do it the way you like. All right, and I think we are ready for dinner. Miso glazed salmon cooked in the pizza oven. You could also do it on the broiler. Oh, you could also do this, by the way, on the grill. Um, you'd want to use kind of preheat the grill nicely, really scrape off the uh, the grill brushes so they're nice and clean. Um, sorry, the grill grate so they're nice and clean with a brush. Um, and then uh, cook it over very moderate heat um, uh, until it, you know, looks nice. And then very carefully flip it over and cook the other side. And that's it. All right, I'm gonna call my family over. Hopefully my daughter daughter's injury is uh, healed. And um, I'll see you later. See you later, folks. Guys and gals and non-binary pals. That's what I say these days. All right, bye.